Um, yeah, it's um, uh, it's kind of one of those sort of uh, um, sort of points in the uh, in, in the, the long history of flag fame where, where many things have happened. That um, and, um, English heritage has been involved in flag fame for I don't know best part of ever since it was first discovered. I think back in back in the late seventies or eighties, whenever it was. Um, I think in, in in total, I think English heritage has put about two. About two million, two point two million, or certainly the, the figures that I've been able to f uh, pick up from our finance account suggest that we've at least put, a, put about a million into excavating the site and developing flag fair and, and bringing in things like uh, the heritage lottery. Uh, back in the days when we could co-fund with things, but one of the things we never did with flag fair was to schedule it. Um, and some people would, uh, Francis would, and Maisie would always say, "Well, why not?" Um, and there's been a big debate in the churches about whether you can actually schedule. It. Uh, archaeology of this, kind, of this nature, uh, wooden sites and various other things. Um, so I thought, g given, the, given the fact that, that we're actually where we are, and we're, but you guys are actually excavating the site, um, and given, given my sort of, uh, uh, sort of background in, in uh, planning archaeology and various other things, I thought it'd probably be appropriate to actually try and talk about some of that sort of stuff, bring that kind of, you know, bring those to the, to the discussion. So um, feel free to, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm here to talk to you guys. Feel free to interject at any point and, and give me a question if you if you want to. I'm going to turn it into a, into an open chat. I don't really mind. You know, we've got beers in hand. That's all great. Brendan, take notes. Take notes. Take notes. Make some notes. Um, yeah, difficult questions from the back. But, um, but don't ask the question that starts with W and ends in Y. This is off the record, Denwell. Should I do the pen trick? Yes. Should, we, should, we, should we cross out the? Uh, uh, <laughs> Across the logo. Um, there we go. So here we go. I thought I thought I'd give you. I had a very good lecture when I was at university, which is a long time ago now. He was a geographer and he talked about um, uh, heritage legislation and various other things. And ever since I taught at university and worked, um, I, I always thought it's very very useful to, to know the legislation. I think very good, some people know it. Some people have a sort of a, uh, a legacy. The other thing is now I work for English heritage. I've really got to sort of give try and you know, give, give a little bit of, bit of a corporate spiel about English heritage because I think people really understand who we are, what we are, why we do stuff and what it is. But I have a sort of a, a, an anecdotal uh, expression of sort of English heritage really is, is that there's quite a, if you go into a pub and you say you work for English heritage and you either get two reactions from, from strangers and members of the public. The first reaction is, oh, I went to visit one of your fantastic country houses uh, or the end or something and I had a lovely day and my kids had a great time out, you know, it was fantastic, it was really nice. Well, the other one is, you bastard, you stopped me having my shed or my building, or you scheduled my, you scheduled my fall. Um, so you always get, this is a dichotomy of, uh, of English heritage. There are two sides to English heritage, and it's a bit of a, you know, I think the, the organisation itself is a bit of a sort of uh, um, uh, eclectic organisation, and has this sort of, uh, uh, this difficult two faces. So I thought we'll go through uh, a little bit of legislation, uh, give you a bit of background about legislation, about his the history of legislation, various other things. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about English heritage, and then I want to come back to and try and finish off with um, a little bit about flag fen and what we're doing in terms of that sort of that sort of present. <coughs> so heritage legislation. Um, I've sort of peppered my slide with some my my talk with some you know good images from the east of England from this region. This is some of the sites to look out for. So you know, pipe up if you know. This is uh, Burr Castle up in uh, Great Yarmouth. Um, one of the best places to go in Great Yarmouth. It's one of the uh, the, the, the late Roman forts. Um, Preserved and it's uh, with its walls and various other things with the medieval castle in the corner of it. It's one of the sort of types of sites that we've tried to protect over the years with, with legislation. This is one of the sites that's, that's benefited from, from, from scheduling over the, over the years. So, what do you get in terms of legislation these days? Um, what is legislation? Where does it come from? How does it develop? What do these things sort of uh, uh, develop? Well, I guess the first thing, I mean, for most people, anybody who works in nature conservation or, or in um, Archaeology or whatever will recognise that the, the, above our own legislation we have the sort of European level. This is a sort of high level uh, stuff, agreements and charters. Um, there are <coughs> English, uh, sorry, the, the British government is signatory or not signatory in some cases, uh, question mark, uh, ratification over uh, a number of charters and conventions. Uh, charter, Venice charter. These are names that would be familiar to people, they're easy to find. You can you know, Google them, you can find them, people off the internet. Um, so I suppose really the, the legislative journey starts with a sort of overview of European uh, European legislation. Uh, it starts with the charters and conventions, and uh, interesting, I put Ramsar down because we are in, in Ramsar was the, the wetland convention which was signed in about '79, which uh, led to increased protection for wetland sites for, for bogs and for and developing sort of. Product. It's kind of interesting really. Uh, uh, even back in those days, 
in 79, the heritage potential of, of sites like Flag Fen was always, was always identified and recognised, um, and was even put into the Ramsar uh, uh, Convention when it was, when it was developed. Um, the Charters lead to this, has led to the development of a series of uh, European bodies. Um, again, they'll be familiar to people. They can, you can find out what they, you know, what they stand for, what they view they have good websites and big websites with their mission statements and all these other weird and wonderful things that they have. Yeah, I just picked out a couple, uh, UNESCO, ICOMOS, uh, various other groups of people. You know, but there are lots of heritage foundations out there for this. Um, and I guess that really comes down to the, the highest level of protection that's been afforded in, in this country, which is our, our World Heritage Sites. There are a number of World Heritage Sites, uh, Stonehenge is the famous one, but the first one where I grew up in, in Ironbridge, um, you know, so-called birthplace of the Industrial Revolution. That's the highest, you know, that, that's what leads to our highest tier of, of, of supposedly highest tier of protection in, in, in terms of uh, how we you know, draw lines on maps as to what our, what, what our heritage is and what it is. Um, I, I'll make a question more, perhaps I should you know, remove that. But you can go with ratification and, and then implementation. And this is the interesting thing about European legislation is that, is that although we, we, I don't believe we have actually ratified the Internet Convention as, as it stands, although I may be wrong about that. Um, there are various other levels of things. However, we have implemented what we said, uh, what that, that high-level European Charter suggests to do, um, in the fact that, that we have implemented primary legislation, or we have primary legislation, which, which, which underpins our, our, our own legislation here in, here in the UK. So, I suppose the one tier below the European, or at least it's you know, primary for the UK government and various other things, depending on, you know, on your particular standpoint, is our primary legislation. Um, and we have a number of heritage acts in the country, which are, which are on the statute books, uh, for, for which we um, which we are able to, um, um, which you we know, need to develop. So, excuse the acronyms for space: 1979 uh, Ancient Monuments and Archaeological Areas Act, 1983 Heritage Act. Um, we have oh, stacks of other things as well. Um, I'll go through some of those in a minute. I'll see you can sort of you know, talk about it if it's, if it's important. The 79 Act is quite it's quite old now. It's a very it's a, it's a slightly cumbersome piece of legislation, and it's not the longest piece of legislation in the world. Um, it's kind of difficult to interpret. It uses a slightly old language. Uh, we have to try and work around these kind of things and try and deal with these things. As it, uh, uh, we're always trying to find new ways of dealing with things. There's new um, interpretations, there's challenges, legal case law. If anyone knows anything about English case law. Uh, or at least the legal system we have. Case law debate, sorry, the legal system is based on case law. Case law. Um, and therefore, anything which goes to, to, to court or whatever, you know, builds the next tier of understanding. So, a lot of what we understand about the Sentinel Act has been challenged in, in, in court in one way or the other, and a lot of what the decisions and things we, we use are, are, are ones that have been challenged. So, you know, on top of the legal sort of position, this has been refined through case law and various things over a period of time. <coughs> The Ancient Monuments and Areas Act does cover uh, UK, it's a UK legislation, but it's divided down into specific things per, per, per part, part of our, our, our region. Um, and that's implemented because anybody who lives outside of English heritage, sorry, in England, um, we have English heritage, the Welsh have Caddy, and in, in Scotland, it's historic Scotland. We're virtually the same thing. We're all commissions um, underneath the primary legislation. Um, but of course, you know, we've got different acronyms and different things, and, and obviously, Caddy does Wales, uh, and, and they do very nicely and, and do, do a very good job. What else is going to affect the historic environment? Um, well, I guess the most important thing uh, is going to be planning policy. And I think it's quite important to try and hit the, uh, again this year, in our recent years, uh, sorry, in this, year, this government, the government has been very clear, uh, this new government has been very clear, about, about trying to define what to understand. They, they say to us, or they say to us, that government does legislation and government does policy. Everybody else does guidance. Previously, we had in, in uh, heritage, um, in our in heritage planning and uh, historic environment, we had um, PPG, the famous document PPG 16, which was a document that Brendan and I started working with many many years ago. Yeah, yeah. You can quote it word for quote it verbatim. <laughs> Just uh, <laughs> the blue page. That's right. Yeah. The, the, the uh, principles of preservation in situ and yeah. various other things like that. Um, Presumption in favour of, sorry, I should have forgotten to say. So we used to have, we used to have PPG 16, planning, uh, planning and policy guidance. The government said, you know, you, know, you do guidance, uh, you're, you're an arms length body, you do guidance, we, we do, we do uh, policy, and we do primary legislation. So basically, 
and we're off and you know, and, uh, you know, get back in your, in your, you know, get back in your box, which is fine. So the government have now replaced um, PPS 16 and what was uh, its precursor PPS 5 this year with uh, the, the uh, National Planning and Policy Framework, which is our which is our new uh, policy guidance for planning. Um, you can start to see how all these things are intermeshing um, in together. We've got Heritage Acts, we've got legislate, primary legislation to protect heritage, we've got uh, policy um, under a separate act affecting planning, uh, we've got the Heritage Act which, which formulates the commissions, uh, English Heritage Academy and various other things, and we have this incredibly sort of, uh, you know, inter interrelationally complex web of, of, of uh, planning policy in different layers, starting at some of the European uh, sort of overarching guidance, uh, and coming down to the bottom with government policy. And I put down here at the bottom uh, sort of guidance, because this is where, where the territory is now, is now sort of um, reduced a lot of what, all of what we do is we provide you know, guidance, advice, and we provide sort of overarching documents for historic environment. And I put up uh, conservation principles, policies, and guidance, guidance, which is one of our latest, our last uh, actually really useful, useful pieces of documentation. Um, yeah, and as I say, this comes under the term of guidance, and it's, and it's designed to provide a sort of overarching principles, really, for understanding how to deal with conservation, um, archaeology, and various other things. It doesn't really deal with archaeology quite so well, but it does deal with cultural value and understanding value and significance in terms of these things. So I hope that gives you a bit of a, a sort of a sort of feel for, for, for that kind of this level of. Um, so we're talking about history. Does anybody know who's general is? What a famous, famous archaeologist, the first archaeologist, I would say. <coughs> Peter Rivers, thank you. Thank you. Well, um, pint of, a cold pint of beer. Hey, you can't find a bar of trolls. Of course, I've forgotten that. Yeah. This is uh, uh, Pitt Rivers. Um, he was, uh, in 1882, uh, named as the first Inspector of Ancient Monuments, a uh, precursor by, by uh, 100 and something odd years. I can't do the math, sorry in my head. So it goes to show basically how long, um, I mean, in some respects, I'm you know, the, the, the last in the long line of, of, of inspectors, or, or potentially the last in the long line of inspectors, I don't know if, if, if the uh, uh, Carolinas are going. But, so we've had ancient monuments legislation since about 1882. We weren't the first country in Europe to give ancient monuments legislation. The first, uh, I think the earliest legislation in, in Europe is, is the Swedish, who were very enlightened. They protected their common land in 1666, and it was all there. Archaeological assets in 1666 but under their under their what they call their, the, the, the Swedish Heritage Act. Quite enlightened, quite uh, you know. I suppose that the Swedish and these uh, sort of Nordic countries have always been Swedish, like you, the, the rest of us, haven't they? Yeah. In some respects, in, in their you know policies and various other things. Anyway, so um, our very first ancient monuments legislation dates from 1882, uh, revised in 1900, again in 1913. I think the 1913 date is quite um, um, an important one, really. That was the first really you know, useful um, dedicated uh, understanding of trying to define what heritage what 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 an archaeological site is what are we trying to protect what are we, and why are we trying to protect it uh, I think you might you may hear a bit more about 1913 in, in the coming years because we, we're getting to the 100 year anniversary of that act of Parliament um, 1933 it was revised uh, revised again in the 50s and then again uh, the current legislation is <coughs> the 1979 ancient monuments and archaeological areas there. Um, Again, we're talking about layers of different types of legislation things come in. So in 1950, we saw listed buildings uh, arrive on the scene. Uh, if anybody wonder where listed buildings were in the, in the system, we've had children of monuments around since the 1880s. Um, in 1950s, to protect Britain from the sort of what was considered to be the post-war um, development boom which was happening around us. So the, the, the reaction to the, the, the loss of medieval city centres like Coventry and Birmingham, um, particularly Birmingham, was a, was a, was a a number of classic uh, cases in there where, where, where the Virgin City Centre was, was changed and wiped out. So we got the 1950s, so the, 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 the reaction to that was to try and protect buildings and list them, which is why we have a separate sort of legislation. It takes a separate legisl uh, legislative path and becomes a, a co act that sits alongside the, the 79 Act. <coughs> in 1983, we had the National Heritage Act, which, which formed the, uh, which, under which English Heritage was formed. But we also have the 1990 Town Country Planning Act, which is the one that has the PPSs involved in the PPG16, uh, sorry, PPG16, PPS5, and now the end of all PF. But also, um, in recent years, we've had a move to try and do what's called heritage protection reform. Um, it would have been an absolute disaster if it had come through in, its, in, its, in, its, in the form it was presented. Um, however, there is still some move of foot 
to try and develop heritage protection reform and to try and resolve those 19, you know, the, the, the issue under the 1979 Act, which are very, very complicated and very, very easy. So anyway, so move on to, to Pitt Rivers. I, I, I dare put a photograph of myself in there, that would be even worse. So what was on the original schedule? What was on the schedule? What was the schedule? Well, the schedule was a list of, uh, of sites. Now, I found this on, I found, found this earlier on. These were the original, sorry, one just off the bottom of the screen here. Um, there were, uh, there were even the, the monuments of uh, England and Wales, probably some were still there. Cabra Castle, I remember Cabra Castle, I remember mm. Vicky Cabra Castle. Arthur's Round Table in Penrith. Neolithic yeah. Henge, I think it is, isn't it? So, something like that. A group of stones known as Stonehenge. So, I don't want to put some of that rubbish in it. Old Stone, yeah. another great site. Um, so you can see that, you know, back, even back in the 80s, in the 1880s, um, we sort of understand, you know, the few of these things. Um, and I think really uh, uh, the, the legislation was sort of brought into focus by, by uh, a very famous case at one of the people in London, West Kennet, where uh, um, uh, he, he was antiquary and digging and, and virtually destroyed the site. And, and, uh, that was what uh, caused um, a, a fluff in the, in the papers at the time and um, developed this in. Well, I don't know what's a uh, Hopper's house in Hutt at the Barslow Moor in Rakewell, Derbyshire. That might be one to go and find out. I'm interested to know where that is. Anyway, so that was what. So, so, so literally, the schedule, um, the site that we say the flag fan is scheduled. Well, uh, what that uh, uh, technically means in, in legislative terms is that it, it joins the long list of sites which are, uh, of which there are now 20,000 uh, scheduled monuments in, in the country, or 20,001 or 20,001 uh, more than there was before. So I think that you know that, that sort of sort of pulls that together. So how does it work in practice? Now that's probably you know that's what is more appropriate to people. And in, I should say under, under the um, um, 1990 uh, planning act, you also get conservation areas, which is another another, another legislative area. So I chose um, an area of Norfolk, um, just to just a small a small uh, village just north of Norwich, uh, to give you a bit of a flavour about how these things work. Yes, um, you can, it's very, it, it's quite common to deschedule sites, um, probably more so now. I, I might talk about that a little bit in a minute, but remind me in a little, in a little while. Um, we have a problem at the moment with um, listing and scheduling overlapping. Oh, okay. So some buildings um, were scheduled in, say, the 1930s. Um, I'll try to think of an example of one of them. A little barn at the Bex, uh, in a place called Bexton in Norfolk, which has got a very beautiful barn. Um, it was scheduled as a as a as an ancient in the 1930s to protect it from demolition. Um, it was also listed at Grade One, and after much discussion, uh, I requested that it be descheduled in favour of its listing because its listing is the most appropriate way to manage that site. There's one or two sites in in there's one of the famous sites in Suffolk which was removed from the schedule because uh, it was thought to be a load of barrows. It turned out to be something completely different. <laughs> Uh, crop, uh, 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 geolog uh, geological um, crop, you know, features from the, from the ice age as opposed to uh, uh, nice circles from the ground. So you're, you're absolutely right. You can take things off it. It doesn't stay on it forever. Some sites have been excavated to the to the nth degree and, 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 and actually have no buried archaeology surviving with them. One might. Uh, yeah. You're right. Yeah, I am. Uh, sorry, I just brought the stool. Not sure what stage you want. I think I think it too was much pasta. Too much pasta, yeah. Too much pasta in the field school, Brendan. That's what you want. You, there you go. You want, you, you want a little chair, don't you? That's what yeah. <laughs> so, right, how does it work in, in, in practice? So, um, Horsemanship Faith is a very, um, is a very nice uh, village. It's a very historic village. And um, in the middle of uh, Horsesham is uh, a priory, Horsesham Faith Priory. Rather than recording, it's in private ownership. It has wall paintings and uh, arcades and various other things left over from its spring. And that was scheduled in the 1930s, but it's also, uh, as you can see from its yellow, from its blue triangle. Blue triangle is listed buildings, red area is a schedule, and uh, the yellow area is a conservation area. So the Horsham St. Faith Priory, is the pri its primary, primary designation is the scheduled monument, um, which is protects the area, it also protects all the soil below the ground, it protects the building above the ground, um, all the archaeology under the ground and various other things. The listed building, uh, listed in grade one, uh, protects that building under, under the list of the building act. Um, the church there is also listed in grade one, 
There are arms houses down here, which are grade two star, and then the rest of these buildings are, are, are grade two uh, listed buildings. The conservation area um, is designed to take in what was the precinct of the former priory, some of the older buildings, including the, the medieval high street, the green here, uh, the arms houses up this end of town, uh, and the extent of what was the, the, the medieval street. Um, and there's one house up here, which is the former manor house, which was linked to the priory by, the, by this uh, medieval road. So you can sort of, sort of see how, how the legislations are all bent over each other and, and laid, up, laid above each other to try and, to try and you know, give that sort of that character. It's worked to a certain extent. The housing estates, the 80s housing estates are all down here. This is uh, 80s ex expansion out on this side. And the industrial area is sort of just away to the, to the east near the, near the main road. So in some respects, you know, those legislations have all bedded together to try and, to try and protect that sort of the, that side. You quite often see if you go to designation maps and you go to uh, the um, Schedule Monuments, uh, sorry, the Sutton Monuments record, or uh, you go to your counties and you go to the, 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 the historic records, that you can find maps like this, you know what's going on the internet, people can you know, do this kind of research for themselves. <coughs> you quite often find sort of maps like this overlaid and you can sort of uh, then, then start to interpret them and pick them apart. But that's not the whole story in terms of archaeology, and I went back to uh, the Norfolk Heritage Explorer website, which is um, their online uh, historic environment record, where all their records are. Uh, and all these red sort of stripes are the archaeology, uh, the other bits of archaeology, the bits that, that, that aren't um, uh, important, aren't so far determined important enough to be scheduled, um, um, or, or given statutory protection, but are considered what we call undesignated heritage assets in the planning system. So if you go to, to the Northern website, these are all the archaeological records that are known about for the size of Horsham's and Faith and the village of Horsham's and Faith. The Priory is here, it's obviously not on their, on their website, but they've got um, a whole series of other archaeological sites all picked out. Uh, I think this is, a, um, this is a, a, a Roman villa down here, there's a, 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 a part of the airport, uh, a big pottery scattered out here, a big medieval um, site up, up this side, uh, another little castle up here, which is, which is quite interesting, somewhere, somewhere removed from the original village original centre. So you start to see how you know it's not just about you know our legislation doesn't just deal with designated assets, but it also picks up stuff like undesignated stuff through through different different areas. A particular interest of mine is the Second World War. Yeah. In particular, the airfields. Yeah. Um, when do you think that or have they already come within the scope of um, protection? Uh, yeah, it's difficult. To interesting to point. That it's um, scheduled in a lot of Cold War stuff the last year. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's a good debate. I mean, it's, it's we're dealing with it. We, working with the Ministry of Justice, we wanted to try and designate bits of archaeology, but, but it was decided we couldn't really schedule an entire airfield. It's such an, an enormous site, and it's very difficult to try and, try and do that. So a decision was taken, uh, which I think was a sort of political decision in some respects, to schedule different aspects of, of sites. So we've got, uh, they did a big survey of all the Cold War sites, they picked out, you know, basic, you know, I think like blast walls or, uh, Thor missile sites, or you know, trying to pick up one of everything. Um, bunkers, we've got a load of bunkers scheduled, various other things. However, they hadn't been, they weren't brave enough, our designators weren't brave enough to actually take an entire airfield. And one of the things I'm, I'm particularly worried about at the moment is losing, particularly Second World War airfields, grass strips, um, you know, because it's very difficult to know. Uh, one of the problems with the 79 Act, in terms of expressly about what you're talking about, it's very, very difficult to schedule a, a grass airfield. Because it doesn't really come under. I, th I think the totality people of the interested would, would be willing to give up the airstrip as such if the technical sites, the buildings, yeah. and the hangars, and things like that had some sort of protection. Yeah, I, say, I, I agree with you. And I think well, one of the issues with I mean, uh, you know, I'll, I can't, can't name the case, but there's a site at the moment where they're discussing removal of the runway uh, from a Cold War site, which is put on top of a Second World War classic open field. Um, circular air base, with most of those Second World War elements in there. You could argue, under certain that the, that the runway is part of the setting of the Cold War assets. We've got designated on the site, including the Second World War assets. We've got fighter pens, blast walls, various other things. I mean, it's quite, you know, uh, I'm sure everybody reads the papers and we'll be able to, particularly in Norfolk, we'll be able to pick out which case it is, but you know, we don't have anything specific about it. The, the issue really is whether or not you can, whether or not that, we can't designate that, that airfield, it's, we haven't designated that airfield in its entirety, but is that, Runway part of the setting specifically of all those assets. It's a difficult, very very difficult point. You know, one that you know debate continues to rage about. 
you can see here, that's the airfield, that's the Norwich, that's the Norwich airfield. Yeah, which you can put down a station there, right? Was it? You know that well. Yeah. Um, the county council picked it out as, a, as an important site, and they put a marker around it as a designated asset, but we haven't. Uh, English Heritage haven't picked it out as a, as a designated asset, although some of the bits of uh, some of the cold war stuff on that site are, are designated. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit of a quick, that was a quick boot through the the, the legislation. I'm going to cut. You know, it goes on. You know, legislation changes, things develop, everything you know changes and, and, and whatever. And I think it's important really to to uh, um, not to sort of dwell on it, but if you've got questions and stuff later on. And, uh, so I thought what I'd do for the second half of this talk is to try and really sort of focus on, on the role of English heritage and various other uh, aspects of, of, of what it is that we, we, we do. <coughs> um, this is Grimes Graves, it's off the bottom of the map, but, but um, uh, again, one of our most famous prehistoric sites, which is uh, under guardianship, which is scheduled, which has got all sorts of different sort of uh, legislations and the various ties over it. It's also open to the public and we can visit it. Um, and I think you know some of these sites sort of illustrate the, uh, the, 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 the role of English heritage. So what are we? Um, we work for DCMS, or I work for DCMS, um, the smallest of government's departments. Currently there's nobody in DCMS because they're all at the Olympics, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> we have a, I don't know what they're doing at the Olympics, I haven't seen any of them on the telly, but you know, <laughs> I think they're all dressed in pink, sort of waving people through this way, this way. Um, so we are, English Heritage is the Government Statutory Advisor on Historic Environment, that's our official, our, our official line. Uh, we are not really English Heritage, English Heritage is our, is our brand name. We are Historic Buildings and, and Monuments Commission for England. That is a statutory title that was set up under the, under the 83 Heritage Act. We are called an arms legs body, which these days we were a, a quango previously, um, non-departmental, um, and we are sponsored, partly paid for by DCMS. <coughs> Um, as I say, the Heritage Act 83 is what we, what we deal with, and um, most of what, what I do in terms of, um, on behalf of the Secretary of State, I, sorry, on behalf of you know, part of the legislative powers, I do on behalf of the Secretary of State, um, we have what we call statutory powers to advise on behalf of the Secretary of State. I still have to go for, when I, when I, if we were advising on schedule, when I'm consent, we would still need to talk to DCMS, and I still have to send my advice to DCMS to get it stamped and signed. Um, it's a very, very sort of uh, sensitive and, and tricky relationship, um, and we're partly funded by the government, which is why we we we, uh, uh, you know, we still have all, all other government departments at the moment. But we also have our own uh, brand, which is why we have the English Heritage brand, as it were, effectively. Um, it's divided into. I'm not allowed to use the word region, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, deep beyond political. Sorry, yeah, yeah, I, I, you know, called local areas. Local areas. areas that's right. Localities. Yeah. What's wrong with regions? Uh, it was banned, uh, well, yeah, it, was, it, it was considered verboten by the last government. One, one word, I think. Or it yeah, but absolutely right. It's, um, <coughs> regions was the uh, Labour government's um, term for the areas, and uh, it was considered not right under the new administration, so, so, so therefore we have to change. So, uh, I've just picked that slide from one of my old presentations. Which is, uh, um, although we no longer have regions, I can cross it out, can't I? <laughs> 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 we don't have territories either, actually. Don't we? It's all rubbish. Get rid of that. There you go. You ain't seen me. <laughs> um, we have uh, a number of regions. Um, we have a number of localities, sorry, um, different offices. This is us, we're East England over here. Um, London, South West, I won't name them all. Um, we all have our central offices, we all try and work, but then you know, we, we, all, we have a central office in, in, in London which deals with deal these things. Um, there are three of me, uh, I'm the inspector for Norfolk and Cambridge, um, I have two colleagues who do uh, the other councils of East England, so Beds and Beds and Hearts, uh, and then uh, Essex, and, sorry, Essex and Hearts and, and Beds and Suffolk. Um, given all the, the sort of band changes and things, we try and keep our, our regions reasonably tight to whatever yeah. political changes there are. Bedford went unitary recently, so and all those. Um, I don't know what it means, Bedford County Council, it's now uh, Bedford Middle, Bedford, Bedford, what a bit, I can't remember what they Irrelevant, but you can see that we we there we you know, we therefore sort of pay, play the piper a little bit. <coughs> this is all recently changed as well. Um, 
we have national collections, which are, I'll explain what all these guys do in, 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 in our time. The national collection is the English Heritage Estate, effectively, it's all the guardianship sites that we have. I'm sure most people have visited at least one in their, in their, in their lifetime if they've travelled travel the country. National planning, which is where I sit. Um, we have national advice and information, which is, used to be our research uh, team. Uh, and we have a few resources up there. Well, yeah. National collections, um, this is uh, a, a sort of, as I say, we have um, about 400 properties, 440. Um, two, uh, about about uh, two thirds of those are free to visit sites. These are sites that have been gifted to the nation. Only, uh, only a handful do you actually have to pay to go into, as you, even less than what we these days. Uh, only also sort of top, you know, the, 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 the top of the most visited sites actually have a custodian that actually sits there and that's good name. Um, I mean, it goes from everything from um, Stonehenge, for example. Um, anybody who lives in this region, does it all be toward the end? Can anyone travel toward the end? It's so one, one of our massive, massive country house, uh, country house estates in, in, um, in, in Essex. So that's the sort of breadth, that's what the sort of top ends stately homes, country houses, uh, you know, Stonehenge and, and Rose Hill places. Down to the really small stuff, um, roadside crosses in Cornwall. We've got you know, um, things that you wouldn't really sort of uh, uh, you know think about. It's the stuff that we sort of look after. Um, you know, we mow the lawn on and whatever else. Uh, even though that you can go into them, uh, you know, for free most of the, most of the time. Uh, no boundaries. And of course, when when people join the church, they join the join the, garbage, uh, join the, 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 the the property side and they come to uh, uh, you know pay their membership and whatever, go around and say. Quite realise that so many of the sites are, are, are actually free. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, in Norfolk, uh, I was trying to think of the sort of local variety. Local, what do we have locally? One of our you know odd things. We've got, we've got a wind dog trying to have in the, in, the, in East Norfolk. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't know what we do with them with all the middle. Of, you know, sort of, it's nice. I think it's great that we have them, but um, you know, it's a pain in the ass to manage. I have to say, I don't know. I don't know nothing about the mills. <laughs> if anybody knows anything about the mills, please, please see me afterwards. Um, so, what do we have? East of England, we have 48 properties, um, and as I say, it goes from everything from state homes to, to, to smaller monuments. So, that's our, our sort of properties divisions. Um, I just want to go through some of the Norfolk ones. Um, uh, Norfolk and Cambridgeshire. I should put Cambridgeshire on here as well because that's where they are on Peter River. Um, Royal 111, we've got a mer some beautiful merchant houses, uh, old medieval merchant houses. We've got castles, obviously, Castle Rising. Quite an iconic site, uh, one that, that, that we that we own. Castle Acre, one of my favourite places in the in the in the country. Really, I think Castle Acre, the priory in Castle. The castle's free. The priory is is uh, is, is paid. Um, Thetford Warren. If you're a prehistorian like myself, I said, I'm sorry, but um, um, Grimes Graves is a prehistoric site for, for, for my fame. You know, my my love of Grimes Graves. Um, Thetford Warren is the medieval Warren site, and that's also free. It's just a sort of building in the middle of, in the, middle of the, the forest there. As I say, many of them are free to visit. <coughs> so, back into more uh, sort of you know, detailed uh, stuff that I think is you know, kind of relevant to anybody who's, who's working. I work for the National Planning Department. Um, I'm somewhere down here in, in planning. Um, we have three different parts of the organisation. Um, three roles within our departments, split into three. One of which is designation, uh, and the other one is planning. Heritage protection designation are really the same, the same thing. Um, designation is, is the process of going about uh, listing, scheduling, uh, assessment, assessment of sites for their, for their significance and their value. Uh, and then national planning, the bit that I do, is, is about managing those sites. Actually, so there's a split, I think it would be, um, we keep a very uh, large, um, area of water between ourselves and between my side of the fence and designation because I think it's very difficult to be poacher and gamekeeper in the same, you can't schedule something and then try and manage it in the same foot here with the same boot, it's very, very difficult to do that. It's much easier to, to have people who are, whose entire role is to look at designation, list of buildings and scheduling. Um, they make the decisions, they deal with their part of the decision. Um, when it comes to management, uh, management these sites, how do you deal with them, you know, all the problems that are associated with them, they're, Ongoing protection, their preservation, their you know, we'll talk about this in, in terms of the in a minute or two. But that's that's why we need this clear blue water between designation and, and planning. So our designation guys, uh, one of our first ever designations in, in Cambridge was the, was the famous site of Case by Norwich, which is a fantastic site. 
the cut marks from the, from the, from the plan marks from the 50s, you can see everything, the Principia, the, uh, the Rebel Wars. So our designation guys, as I've already said, responsible for listing and scheduling, and they um, maintain the, the National Heritage List for, for, for England. They're also responsible for, for um, uh, managing, um, managing the list, maintaining it, making sure that the, 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 the sites on there are accurate. So that um, if you own a listed building, you can, you know, you can phone, you can ask um, our designation colleagues to understand to, to uh, ensure that that site is properly designated and that's been done for own. In terms of what you were saying earlier on, we've delisted buildings as well. A number of buildings, uh, many buildings have been delisted, whether they're in there, they're in But also, one of the we were reading the news uh, newspapers yesterday will know that uh, Shilford Hall in Cambridgeshire, a very nice, uh, great two listed barns, recently burnt down, will, will have to be delisted now that it no longer exists on, as, as a site itself. Um, so here, our National Planning Department. Sorry, I'm duplicating some slides here. I should, I should move on. So what is it I actually do? So what do, what, what do we do? So I've already talked a little bit about statutory work. So I, I am um, the uh, effectively the Secretary of State for, for Culture, Media and Sport. Um, I, I, you know, I am sort of uh, partly responsible for, for his work in this region. So you know, in some respects, I answer directly to the, to the Secretary of State for statutory uh, consultation, statutory you know, work really. Um, we give advice, we give grants, um, and we do this sort of random thing at the bottom, which is sort of heritage at risk, which is you know, come back in recent times, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through it. So those are basically the four sort of rough areas of the work that I do um, in, in no equal measure. Um, I think it's sort of classic really as to, as to what it actually does. That, what actually does that mean in terms of what we do? Uh, you know, my colleagues and I. Uh, just, there are two of us look after, uh, one looks after buildings, I look after monuments in, in Norfolk. Um, and you can actually see that the number of assets that we could actually, that we have actually, you know, sort of got, that we are, we are responsible for in some, in, in some ways, are actually quite high, particularly to So the figure headline is 57,000, I think that's correct as, as, of, as of going to press, uh, about 60,000 listed buildings. Um, the higher graded listings are the ones that we tend to deal with the most. The lower, the local authority is grade two. But you can still see the figure headlines are quite high. We're talking about we're talking about twenty years, sorry, two thousand, two thousand grade one listed buildings and uh, three and a half thousand grade two star listed buildings. That's for one, you know, for what, you know, for three people. That's quite heavy work. There's a huge amount of, of stuff out there which people do. Uh, conservation areas, about a thousand of those, and this is me down here. Uh, about two thousand children monuments in, in in the counties of which. Um, approximately uh, about half of those are in Norfolk and Cambridgeshire. Uh, we also do listed parks and gardens, everybody loves gardens and garden archaeology, the, the sort of gardens list. Um, battlefields we do as well. We, you know, and we also have response, I also have responsibility for sign up on the um, consent for the guardianship assets. Sorry, what's guardianship assets? Sorry, uh, I should have I should, those are our sites, the ones that we own, the ones that are owned by the country. Um, uh, under the terms of the Guardianship uh, 79 Act, there's something called guardianship where you can where you can give your property to the state, into the care of the state. It's different from National Trust. The trust is a is a is a private a private organisation. As I say, it's a, it's a trust. If you if you were if you were to go bankrupt and sell your estate to the, whatever your large estate is in, in, in England. <laughs> You might, you might have a, an expansive country house somewhere up, up, up north. Um, if you were to go bust, and, and you, you could either put it into trust, or you, you know, potentially put it into trust, uh, no, whereby giving it to the National Trust as a sort of uh, uh, a way of dealing with your, your tax and death duties, or you could give it in guardianship to the new charity, to, to, the, to the state, into the care of the state for the rest of the world. And, and, and that's what's going on. Um, when we talk about the guardianship assets, these are the sites that you know, like Grand Graves, um, or the end was, was gifted by the Earl of Suffolk in the you know, uh, no, sorry, 1960. You know, death duties have crippled them, and they, and they, and they, they gave, 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 it, gave it away. Can I just ask a question about that then? Yeah. Given the sort of state of the economy and what's going on right now, is there a potential for the church to basically turn that kind of stuff down? Like someone wants to gift you with something, could you say thanks but no thanks? Yeah, I, I mean, we haven't bought. I mean, I'm just trying to think of what we what we've actually acquired in recent years. I think in, in the last five years we've only acquired two properties. Um, one of which is Eightthorpe House, which everybody I mean, probably know about. Mm. From, from, I suspect you were probably covering it in your tenure as editor. You were probably covering 
it's purchased during that period. Yeah. So um, that that was an odd 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 acquisition. And the other one we bought was Harmsworth Barn. Yeah. Knows Harm, yeah. Harmsworth. It's it's quite famous. It was, it's on the end of the runway, uh, on the end of T five, um, and was going to be demolished as part of the. Um, it was bought by a venture capital company to to basically to to I think to demolish and to sell as a as a as a you know, McCarney building, uh, McCarney set building, <coughs> and we acquired that under some I don't know, you know. so it, those are the only two properties I can think of we acquired in recent years. Mm -hmm. I, I have to say I wouldn't be keen on acquiring properties and make because there's no unless what the National Trust do is they put their they, they will ask for a stipend to go with that building. They won't acquire a property unless it has a legacy, uh, and the legacy is is you know. A, a, a amount of money in trust to, to ensure the ongoing maintenance of that building. And of course we don't have that as, as a state, we've taken stuff on and, and you know, we have to deal with the maintenance backlog. Something like all at the end, you know, it's got, I can't remember, it's got two, you know, 250 square metres of roof, up, lead on the roof up there, you know, all of which at some point in time all these, you know, it's, it's one of those sort of things, it's, you know, it's an ongoing burden yeah. asset. But under the, um, um, we're not the only people who take into the guardianship, uh, local authority can take into the guardianship, and we have recently, um, just discussions with local authorities who are trying to offload their assets because they because they can't afford the, 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 the maintenance burden. And there is an interesting issue there about whether we should sign off the sale of assets in guardianship. Um, my view is so far no. <laughs> I don't think we should. It's in local authority guardianship it should be in the same conditions as we would have our, you know, as it is for English heritage. Uh, and therefore that, that presents a, a, an issue Complication. Well, that's your advice. Um, sorry, is that your question? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so what would come under the term statutory advice? So that would be works to the grade one and grade two style listed buildings, um, maintenance, uh, repair, uh, new additions to, uh, and various other things. Um, new developments in conservation areas, so sites over a thousand square metres or zones. Um, it's set at about a thousand square metres to try and pick up. Quite, quite small, you know, quite reasonably sized developments. You can imagine supermarkets these days, lots of supermarket jobs come in, city centres, conservation <coughs> areas, trying to develop in, you know, in, in historic city centres. Um, and we've tried, we, we bought, there's this policy that's come into this, this legislation for tall buildings, um, and everybody who knows about the shard and the discussions recently in the papers, <coughs> part of the reason why there's been so much discussion about the shard it is because it's, it, it's tall. It's, it's tall structure, it's status, whatever. Um, everyone's got their own view on that. It's quite interesting to, 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 to take pot, a straw poll on what it is. Again, this is me down here. Application of schedule monument consent, uh, and developments affecting the setting of the schedule monument. So, so that, that means, um, uh, in case of this site, um, developments on flag fen, um, the new developments, whatever the new developments we need to do with the schedule monument consent. Um, but also we would have a planning uh, gain say in, in um, any development which is around the perimeter of Flagfair, we'll come to that in a minute or two, there's lots of developments around here, um, some of which, most of which have, uh, have been in front of the prior to it being scheduled. However, uh, in the current climate, um, the setting of schedule one is very much a part of the, the, the current uh, annual PF and national planning framework. And, um, we also do this bottom, you know, stuff to do with battlefields, parts of gardens and those things, and, and there are all these expertise within English heritage. Lots of other stuff we do, um, <coughs> support and advice, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's all very well saying we're the statutory designated, you know, your land is scheduled, what do people, what does that actually mean for people? You know, it would be wrong not to stand here and actually try and help uh, people to try and manage that site. We, we as archaeologists want to try and protect our archaeology, and I think that's absolutely right, right that we do that. However, it's not right that we don't then follow that up with, with, with good advice. Conservation areas, appraisals, looking at when they're at risk, whether there's design, design development. I mean, we do lots of stuff on design work, um, working with local authorities to try and improve the setting of city centres, trying to get rid of some of that 60s crap, trying not to, re, re, try not to deal with that again, trying not to... <coughs> To, re, uh, you know, to end up with the same kind of uh, development going on again uh, as those 60s sites become overworn and over, uh, overdeveloped. Um, you, you know, we don't want to have the same problems we've had over and over again. We also give um, support and advice to local authorities and our, our partners, uh, people City Council, and those sort of things. We were here yesterday talking to um, the leaders of the university and various people. It was a very interesting day yesterday. 
Um, we also give support and advice to, to owners of buildings and um, we also give support and advice to our own properties departments about how well they should be maintaining and managing their buildings. So it's quite a broad range of experience and things that you, that you need to carry around. Stuff like this, uh, you know, we're getting very much, uh, everyone says, oh, you kind of, you know, kind of plastic windows or various sort of things. What we try to do is try to uh, inform the discussions and the debates. It's not just about whether you should be having plastic windows or whether you should have wooden windows. It's about energy conservation, for example. That's one of the areas that we've currently gone into in terms of our, our we, we're sponsoring a whole series of um, um, projects around the country about, about how to, about, about the value of, uh, you know, one type of conservation, sorry, one type of uh, glazing against another type of glazing, secondary glazing. These are all sorts of interesting uh, side areas where, where we're getting. Uh, basically, so we can produce advice notes and guidance on, on how to deal with, um, you know, energy conservation in, in old buildings. You don't really want to spoil the character of the building, you don't want to change the character of that building, but everybody wants to be able to manage that building efficiently. And, you know, we haven't all got endless uh, fuel bills and you know, fuel, fuel, the cost of fuel is rising. We do need to, you know, deal with these questions. How do we deal with energy conservation in historic buildings without um, changing their character or, or ruining them in, in any particular way? Um, and I've also mentioned as a past, we also give out grants. Um, English Heritage uh, last year, so I've only got the figures from 2010, 2011, um, but we had um, 3.75 million pounds of grant aid. That's, that's just what, I, what we give out in the region. Uh, and it goes in various different ways. Places of worship, this is anybody who uh, is a church warden who lives in a parish. Um, uh, churches uh, of grades, uh, any grades, are, are eligible for grant aid for works to, you know, for rooms and whatever. And let's face it, um, whether you're um, um, of Christian denomination or other denominations, the churches uh, are some of the best stack store of medieval. Uh, and later period architecture in the whole of the country. And therefore, you know, whether you're, a, uh, you know, whether you're actually going to worship in these places or not, um, it doesn't detract from the fact that they are a, an amazing resource in terms of what they are and what they do. So therefore, it would be right to try and, try and protect them, uh, taking away any sort of uh, controversy about religion or various other things. Um, we also, um, place of worship is not defined to Christian place of worship. Um, it's other denominations. We, we have grant a, a Sikh temple. Um, we're working with the Jewish community in London at the moment to develop a, a, a program of repairs on, on some of the some of the Jewish cemeteries in Jewish, uh, which are, I think, very in a difficult state and, and um, require a bit of, bit of TLC. Um, <coughs> secular grants: these are for buildings, highly graded assets, or shed monuments which are, are um, outside of the, that sort of area. So we give grants uh, grants to, the, to these organisations. We have the small capacity building grants and the section 17, which is specifically the monuments to help farmers manage sites. Um, designed originally to try and take land out of the plough uh, and to give a small payment to the farmer to, to, to offset the, the, the loss of income. Um, I think it was originally designed for you know, small payments for barrows and things in the middle of fields, but actually it's developed into a, a, a sophisticated programme of small grants. We can target uh, minor repairs on <coughs> buildings. Um, a very sophisticated use of money for, for interpretation, uh, improving access and understanding of, of monuments. And the last thing is sort of, sort of running up to the end of this, this sort of phase, we're talking about heritage at risk. Um, this is one of the uh, government's targets for the, for the future. It's definable, measurable and quantifiable, as, as the Minister put it. Um, so therefore we now have um, a series of at-risk targets, the idea being that if heritage is, 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 at, is at risk, then you must be able to do something about it. And by identifying it, you then put it, you, you, know, you can then, then target your resources to those sites. Which are, we started off some, some years ago with buildings, looking at you know, buildings at risk. It was a, a, a sort of um, uh, a theoretical principle. You can see uh, this is one of my favourite buildings in Norfolk at the moment. This is the medieval gatehouse at St. Bates Abbey in, in Norfolk Broads. It's got a windmill which was built into the gatehouse. The gatehouse has survived, but it's in, in, in a very, very difficult condition. It's been fenced off for a number of years um, because of the problems of falling masonry and various other things. Um, this year, finally, after about five, five years of negotiation, I managed to get heritage lottery funding for that building to put a, a, a dome cap on the, on, the, uh, on the windmill tower and to repair the, the masonry. Um, therefore, taking it off the atmosphere register from, since it was on since the 1990s. So we started off with buildings at risk, uh, we've, put, we've added scheduled monuments at risk, those sites which are heavily ploughed, which are being you know, subsoiled and we've got potatoes all over them every year, which are you know, disastrous. Um, flag fame is a monument at risk, uh, it's 
it's safe to say that because the risk assessed because of the difficulties that we've all been dealing with. You know, you guys have dug it first hand. You know that the sites, the wood, the timber, the things that make Flagstone special is you know degrading. It's the wood is very soft. We don't know how long it's going to be here for. Uh, you know, just so soon. So immediately it goes onto the sh it becomes a, a shadow monument. It, I risk assessed it and risk is, risk assessed it at high risk for obvious reasons. I don't even need to go into that. Everyone knows it's a high risk. Um, so therefore, that, that, that allows us to, to, or should allow us to target resources, uh, other aspects of that, and, and raise the agenda. We've got parks and gardens at risk, uh, battlefields, we did battlefields at risk, those sites which are ploughed, which have got housing estates you know, threatened for them and trying to protect all those things. Shipwrecks was another famous one. Uh, Pertin holes, you know, boats on the shore. How do you deal with this? How on earth do you, you know, the legislation in 1979 was never really designed to cover the breadth of stuff that we deal with. How do you deal with shipwrecks? They're not, you know, they, they can be moved, technically they can be moved. You know, th these are, you know, really difficult conservation uh, questions. A couple of years ago, we did conservation areas at risk. It was very, uh, that was very controversial because the local authorities who look after these areas were, were, were not very pleased to find out that, that they've not been really doing their town planning properly. And it does <coughs> rather sort of poke, poke the stick at uh, some of the town planning decisions that we made. And you know, possibly that was not, not, not the most particularly sensitive uh, thing that we've ever done. Um, the new category for 2010 was places of worship at risk. All these fantastic medieval churches. I think there are 600 medieval churches in Norfolk. Uh, of which uh, only, a ha you know, only uh, half of those are actually regularly worshipped and um, therefore the other 300 or so, 200 at least, are, are, are without, to, uh, are without uh, anybody to, to, to care for them on a daily basis. And last year, for those people like myself, um, industrial heritage at risk was our latest category. Very interesting, very useful, very detailed stuff because a lot of our industrial heritage is disappearing quite quite. Well, it has it's always a bit edgy, people don't understand it, you know, people don't really want to try and deal with stuff which was uh, you know built uh, often quite shovelly um, you know for an industrial purpose which has now ceased um, and have now thought and now dysfunction is something you know uh, I think although the World Heritage Sites at Ironbridge for example, the Southern Industrial Revolution, we haven't been able to deal with medieval Manchester sorry in, in central Manchester for example, which has got all the mills. Uh, you know, the canals, uh, all that sort of cotton industry, king cotton and all those sort of things. We never really managed to get all of those. Uh, never been able to deal with that. A lot of that stuff is now gone. Um, where you come from? Bradford? Or where, where do you come from? Bradford. Yeah, so there's... Sunny West Yorkshire. All those mills and things that have been pulled down in the last you know, 20, 20 years. Or changed into yuppie flats. Right? <laughs> Saltaire or something like that, is it? Is it you know, it's sort of... Um, so I don't want to pick on you, I'm not going to pick on you. <laughs> Not only because you come from Bradford, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, used to it. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. A chip on both shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, mean, I could put you at risk if you like. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So just for at risk, uh, it's a big one for me. I, mean, I grew up in I grew up in the Midlands, um, you know, looking at um, uh, you know looking at canals and various other things, and, and a lot of that stuff is now gone. You know, we need to try and try and protect some of that stuff, understand it, pick it up. Um, I mean, you were talking about. Um, military sites, uh, Second World War sites, this is the latest category of stuff which is, is disappearing. Most of the air bases in England have been, have been decommissioned, and I would say a very huge percentage of them. Um, every big site, Green and Common, for example, has been com almost completely removed from the, from the landscape. Green and Common is a fa you know, famous site. My, you know, my mother's camped outside the base there for, for, for years. Probably explains an awful lot, doesn't it, really, about me. Um, but, but, you know, it's, it has always resonated for a lot of people who, who you know, and that's all and largely gone, it's a long way included. So the attempt to be made to protect them under the battlefields uh, at risk? This is a difficult, another difficult question is that, is that uh, I think some of them are, are I, I don't know that the battlefield designation is actually able, to, is, is really able to, to, to be flexible mm. enough to encompass some of these things. It would, would be an interesting thing to try to try and try that. Yeah, um, it's a schedule and those battlefields are pretty weak, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. battlefields is quite, as you say, it's, it's quite a, it's not a, it's not a really strong it's not a really strong legislation, it's not a battlefield one. I mean, scheduling would be a, you know, but you, it's so difficult to schedule something as big as, big as that. You think, you know, it's, it's only sites of key. I think Greenland was a, was a real test case, really. The, 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 county, the, the, the runway went to make Newby Bypass and, and was seen as a sort of, you know, get rid of it, it's a horrible site, you know, nobody wants to remember anything about it. But, but in doing so, you've really sort of lost the significance of all the, the, you know, of that site's entirety. I mean, maybe, um, you know, I don't know, I mean, you know, 
from my point of view, as a sort of heritage legislator and various other things, I mean, you know, that, to me, is a bad thing, losing that heritage. Other people might say exactly the opposite. I think this is why these things are so controversial, because actually, the I don't want to know about it. Yeah, the name became blighted, didn't it? Yeah, the name is blighted. Because it yeah. just, just destroyed the previous history. Green and Common is known by everybody around. But on the other hand, up just down the road from Green, is up a Hayford, isn't it? And that's quite heavily designated. Actually, that, 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 there's, there's lots of protection work going on there. I think some of the lessons at, at Greenham have been, have been learned for upper hand. Anyway, so maybe the next category might be, you know, we want to do we just, uh, sort of the Second World War and uh, first, first Second World War um, and heritage at risk. Uh, that might be, might be 2012's category. Um, just quickly, um, we have another, another branch of English Heritage, which is National Advice Information. They you know, give us information. They, they, um, do research on buildings, they do research on techniques and money, some of, the, you know, some of our, our best year physics developments have come from, uh, from, our, from our colleagues in, in English Heritage. Um, you know, I'll just put some images up there of stuff that we've, you know, interesting stuff that, that we've been looking at recently, concrete post-war buildings, um, you know, these are Richard and Kendall's in Cambridge, um, destination case. Phone boxes, you know, people squirts. You know, the loss of phone boxes I think, is, a, is a great tragedy, particularly the, uh, the K6s, the Gilbert Scott design of phone boxes. Um, and, and so, as a consequence of losing all these sites in, in, in the 80s, nobody has phone boxes anymore. I mean, you know, I've, most of the ones I have to know which is survived like this have got books in them. People are using them as bookstores. Like, it's a brilliant use of a, uh, of a phone box. But, um, so, you know, the difficulty is, if we haven't tried to, we've, put, we've now listed and scheduled a whole stack of these Gilbert Scott telephone boxes to stop them being removed. Um, and they're kind of iconic, it's a bit like the red buses in London, all that sort of stuff, which is sort of iconic British. Do you do post boxes? Sorry? Do you do post boxes? Yeah, we've got, the we've got listed post boxes. Um, you probably remember in the press recently, we listed, they, they uh, listed, I think they listed it, um, Abbey Road, the crossing at Abbey Road that the Beatles walked across. Oh, wow. um, unfortunately, it's 20 yards down the road from where, where the ones were originally taken, but anyway, you know, the thought's there, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> It's sort of iconic, isn't it? It's, it's, still, it's still the iconic uh, legislation, I think. Um, as I say, research, we still do research. Not much of it these days. There's not many, many researchers left, but we still do a bit of research. Right, so I guess, you know, I just want to give a couple of slides at the end here. Um, this is the designation for Flag Fan. Here we are. It's the first time I've seen the whole thing. I've seen the whole thing. That's, it's pretty enormous. So it goes, um, here's the road. Can I come off? Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So uh, you come in from the, um, there's a power station, power station's here, yeah. so you come down the road, you've got a sharp turn where, where everyone dumps all their rubbish, mm -hmm. people dump this rubbish, and then turn down, you come to the, 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 the toll <coughs> across the road here, turn, and then the road into flag fans down here. Mm -hmm. So we scheduled the, the causeway, or tried to schedule, mm -hmm. and attempted to schedule what we know of, <coughs> the causeway, the platform and island, and the crop marks at the dry land end. Yep. And there's a hole in it here, because that was, quarried, and there's another hole down here because that is also quarried. Now, this was dug away under the um, Francis Pius Fenger excavation, so there's no point in that, it's already gone, uh, although it's still iconic in terms of its, in its archaeology. We don't know what's in the end, we don't know what's down here, we don't know what's down here, we don't And just to put you guys in the picture, the reason why this was so important is, you know, obviously Peterborough is on this massive growth spurt. And there's a development schedule in this area yeah. for yeah. within the next 18 months. Couldn't, find, it? couldn't find the pictures, but um, yeah, well, this is, this is a pretty good point actually. I mean, the, the, this is this is probably the thing to end on, really, and the thing to discuss uh, quite widely here. Um, Flight has never been scheduled, so uh, development has, has sort of increased. Peterborough has expanded rapidly. Whenever we, um, oh, you know, right, it's, it's a new town. It's got ambition. Uh, it wants to be, uh, you know, a new town. And, and, and you know. Um, outside of those politics, um, are, you know, it's, that's for Peterborough and Peterborough's people and Peterborough's politicians to decide how they want their city to be and how they want it to develop. Everyone needs jobs, economic development is important. Um, however, Peterborough has always seen the eastern side of Peterborough as this, this sort of fen, fen edge and, uh, as its sort of area for growth. Uh, and over the period of years that I've been working in the coming here, I've seen uh, Peterborough expand out. So, um, the problem with planning and planning legislation is that unless it's designated, you don't really get a foot in the door in terms of putting the schedule, schedule, scheduling onto flag phone uh, makes a massive difference for, for, for me in terms of planning because it means that every planner, every, uh, anybody who wants to do any development out here will, has to take notice of that site. So it doesn't necessarily mean that we can protect the site in its entirety, but it does mean that, we, that we're around the table when we're doing the discussions. 
So scheduled for this area here um, is the Prell, uh, Prell plant, which I don't know is energy from waste, I believe, but I don't know uh, an awful lot about it. Um, it's been in, was planned, it's went through planning about five years ago, so it's, you know, it's been, been uh, programmed for a long time. Um, and that will come almost to the edge of, or it will come to the edge of the, the scheduled monument here. Uh, this is Red Brick Farm here. Um, we were at uh, Public Inquiry last year. Uh, to argue with the developer about, uh, about this area, about, about whether or not it was uh, appropriate to include that in uh, Peterborough's plan for, for expansion. Um, although we, we lost the argument about it should be included in the plan, I think we, we, we know it should be included in it. It's obviously a decision for Peterborough to, to, to say where it's going to put its factories in the, in the year. What we did identify was that, that this is an important bit of uh, weather. Uh, which is linked intrinsically via the drainage networks from around this area to Flag Fen. A development up here will have an impact on Flag Fen. A development down here will impact on Flag Fen and so kind of way. What the impact on the water table of having a, 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 a three-story three basement in the um, in the Prell plant, I, I've got no idea. That's one thing that we, uh, we're going to find out, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, I simply have no way. I mean, simply have no way of knowing what sort of impact that's going to have on, on the size of this. So, sure, I do have a question. Um, Sorry. If, if you think Sorry. that's going to impact on it, how is how does the um, scheduling protected then, surely that, that well, kind of development isn't really going to yeah, go against it. It's a good point. I mean, what we should have done, we scheduled it 10 years ago. Yeah. I've had a chance of protecting it. That, that's the issue. It wasn't scheduled until last year. Um, so, so we haven't really got any, we can't, we can't do anything about development which has already been proposed. And, uh, and, and, and you know, and, and rightly so, we can't, you know, we can't try and back them. Um, well, what we should, what we might be able to do, we would argue to try and do is to use some of the, 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 the money that goes with development, the sort of say 106 community money, to, to, to use that to, to better effect to try and research what we should be doing. You know, to my way of thinking anyway, and you know, perhaps to uh, Brenda, Lisa and, and uh, the owner of Ivasa, we should be talking mm -hmm. to the developers uh, about how we can use the funds to the best example to, to gain as much knowledge as we can about the site. Mm -hmm. uh, if we can't protect it, we may have to find some other way of managing it, and that's, that, that's the discussion. Um, you know, is it a, I mean, scheduling is a, is a way, the principle behind scheduling is to try and protect something for the future generations. In a case such as this, it's very, very difficult. It brings up a whole series of philosophical discussions about whether sites should be scheduled, whether we can actually protect sites for the next generation. It may be that we are the next generation and we have to do something about it. That's, that's, that's the point. Um, I, I don't have a, I haven't, I haven't formed a view. Um, on, on many other sites, I mean, sort of, I was up at, uh, with um, Raksha and, uh, and I were up yes, uh, yesterday, two days ago. Uh, you may have heard uh, Tony Robinson talking about uh, Durabrivo, uh, not Durabrivo, um, the Brown Dunum, the, the Roman Fort of Brancaster. They put three small trenches in that site, and the archaeology is beautifully preserved underneath. The, the, the whole Roman Fort is there, uh, lots of pottery there. So it's a perfect scheduling. It's under, the site is protected. Um, yeah, there's no, you know, it's, it's under a benign farming regime. Um, by all intents and purposes, probably nothing you know, sort of happens. That site could be preserved indefinitely for, you know, for future generations. It's important yeah, you know, to recognise that. We've identified and characterised it. Um, but my view is always that we shouldn't necessarily sort of close things off, but that we do need to continue to research sites. And I'm very much in favour of doing targeted research uh, on scheduled monuments uh, to try and keep on defining their character. This is one of the, the, the key things, but I don't think we should be digging them in entirety. Lots of development archaeology, uh, <coughs> archaeology stuff that, that, that we've all been dealt with as, as our, in, our, in our early careers or part of our careers, and part of the bread and butter for many archaeologists is about, is about the destruction of archaeology. It's about preserving by record, and, and these are the two, the two sort of dichotomies in, involved. Yes. Um, could your research department not commission or suggest? digs on either side to see what's there. Yeah, potentially, but we, we like everybody else, we don't have that sort of, we don't have that huge amount of resource. I mean, we can give, you know, the government has, de has determined that we will have a, a, a grant programme which we can give grants out to other people, but not necessarily um, to commission work on, on this kind of way. It's one thing I'd like to try and get together with our research guys to try and do that, to put that into the programme, see whether or not that, that we could Target some of our resources to answering specific questions, specific sorts of, uh, you know, either scientific-based questions about preservation of that specific aspect. One of the problems with this sort of stuff is, is I find that the science behind preservation 
is so difficult uh, and it's never really been nailed down. Um, despite the fact that we've been looking at this for the best part of 20 years, you know, myself included, it, it's very, very difficult to work out what factors create. We all know that if you load a water table, archaeology has disappeared. But, you know, why? How? What do you do? You know, can you gain that back? And if you can re-wet it, what happens to it? All in terms of persons, re it doesn't seem to do anything about it. It continues to be over the period of time. What are the factors? What are the critical factors for that? Is it pollution? Is it, is it polluted water that causes the problem? Um, Star Car, the famous, the famous site up in, up in Yorkshire, the recent excavations of the, the nitrates in the, in the soil seem to be having an accelerated effect on, on degrading the wetlands. Um, the wetlands are you know, you know, critical to the sort of, you know, this is. The implications are even worse for carbon sequestration and, and you know than they are for, but also they have an impact on the archaeology. There was a big piece in the paper about, about loss of wetlands through the fact that, that if you farm the top of them, the, the, the methane you know, just, just, just evaporates and so we're losing our, all that carbon uh, CO, you know, in CO2 straight out into the atmosphere. The problem for us as arche archaeologists is that that peat is archaeology. That is what the archaeology is, it's archaic peat, it's pollen, it's you know, and, and so, you know, whilst you're losing carbon, you're also losing archaeology in its, in its entirety. So these are, these are really, really difficult questions. It, it is in, I have to say, it's, I, I should have been fight then is with some trepidation because of the, the, the amount of difficulty and various other things to do with it. But I think that's why our designation department have taken so long. Um, they were asked to, originally asked to change it about five, about, about ten years ago when, when Francis and Maisie first uh, uh, we're, we're coming to the end of their first excavation program and sort of you know, developed their, their, their understanding about it. Them, but they found it very difficult to do so. They, 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 what are we scheduling? How big is it? Why old is it? Um, uh, we were slightly bolder and I think you know, in terms of trying to capture that and also trying to capture some of the, the setting of the moment, which is this, you know, the, the crop marks on the dry end. That dry end is gone. The northern remains, that one of those, you must know the story by now. You know, so we've, got, we've got some of the fen gates, sorry, the, uh, the, the Bronze Age settlement goes from. I don't know, difficult questions. I mean, you know, very happy. I can, we can talk about it, you know, for, for, for whenever. But we ask the questions anyway, so. Would you, would you rather go back to the, would you rather go back to that one? Thanks very much. Oh, yeah, far away. Well, that was great. Has anyone got any questions?